Hello, and welcome to another edition of FNR Ask the Expert. Um, first of all, happy World Snake Day and also National Forest Week. Um, did you know that there are 3,500 species of snakes in the world and 600 of them are venomous and are, many of them are protected on public lands? So we'll talk more about snakes a little bit later. Um, today, we're going to be talking about wildlife myths or commonly held wildlife facts that many of you may have heard. Um, today, we're going to be joined by wildlife extension specialists, Brian McGowan and Rod Williams. We'll be discussing everything from birds to toads to hellbenders and coyotes. If you have questions, put them in the comments section here on Facebook and we'll address them throughout the broadcast. But to get us started, this time of year, there's lots of baby animals around and uh, we're seeing you know, birds falling out of nests or you might see a baby bunny in your yard or a deer that seems to be left all alone. And I know many of us have been told for years, don't touch them because the mom won't come back and they'll be abandoned for life. Um, I know that I've heard that with rabbits and many other animals. So Brian, let's start there. Is that really the case? Is the mama gonna leave them alone if I have to touch them and put them back in the nest or whatever? Yeah, so uh, hello. Uh, it's good to see everyone out there. Um, so that's a good question and it's one that comes up every year. Uh, but the truth is really that that's not the case. And so, um, you know, I, you people touch animals all the time and, and they still come back. Um, so uh, from that standpoint, it's probably something that people just told their kids just to kind of keep them from picking things up and messing with them. But the truth is um, the mom, the parents will come back and there won't be any issues. Um, probably the only sliver of truth out of that is with some birds in nest construction. And so the presence of people around that or some type of a disturbance around that can cause them to abandon a nest. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, it's fine. People in wildlife coexist all the time. But I think, Brian, if I can chime in and add on to what you just said, you know, the scenario you gave with abandoning the nest, uh, that's before the parents are investing in laying in those eggs. Usually once the female either lays eggs or the mother gives birth, one, that maternal bond is very, very strong. And the female has a lot invested in those offspring. That they're, so they're highly unlikely to uh, just abandon them based on a simple touch by a human here or there. Well, good to know. Myth number one, busted. So, <laughs> okay to save the baby animals. Um, okay, so switching gears a little bit, since it is World Snake Day, um, let's give our, our snakes some love or not, um, in my case. But I know Rod is a herpetologist, so we'll let him, we'll let him have this one. Um, a few snake questions for you. Um, is it true that if I encounter a snake, it will chase me? Uh, highly unlikely that snakes are going to chase you. In most of the scenarios that I've had people describe that to me, it's where a person is, you know, walking or hiking and they encounter a snake and they usually become startled. Most people get startled when they see a snake. Some of us, like Brian and myself, perhaps maybe we get excited when we see a snake, but most people get startled and then they may take a couple of steps in any one direction. But if you think about that snake, they oftentimes have home ranges that are set up. They know their immediate vicinity. They know, that they know their immediate surroundings very well. And oftentimes, many wildlife species, including snakes, have predetermined escape routes. So when they encounter a human, the first thing the snake is oftentimes thinking is, I need to flee. And if their escape route happens to be in the general direction of that person or where that person is going, it appears that the snake is chasing you when really what it's trying to do is use its predetermined escape route to elude you essentially. Brian, you want to add anything on the snake front? Don't let Rob had all, Rod have all the fun. No, I think that's uh, that's perfectly that's that's accurate. Um, the only time I've had snakes come after me is uh, when I'm trying to pick them up. So they're just defending themselves. So um, they got other things to do besides um, mess with people. They they want to catch the things they want to eat and do what snakes do. While we're on the topic, are there any snakes I should be wary of or places that maybe I shouldn't be going or things I shouldn't be doing if I do encounter a snake just to protect myself um, as someone who is one of those people who would be likely to freak out and run? Well, 
you know, we only have four uh, venomous species of snake in Indiana, uh, two rattlesnakes, the Massasauga rattlesnake and the timber rattlesnake, uh, the copperhead, and then the cottonmouth or water moccasin is another name for that. Uh, most of those are very rare. Um, um, some of them have very unique habitat niches. So like, for example, with the Massasauga rattlesnake, you only find them in certain types of wetlands uh, in parts of northern Indiana. But again, most of these snakes are very rare. Um, just to give an example, um, for, for my master's project years ago, I spent two years walking and hiking and doing research in, in southern Indiana woods, and I never once came across a timber rattlesnake. Uh, well, years later, I did a project on timber rattlesnakes in those same area, and, and you know, obviously when I'm doing that project, I, I came across some. So um, they're, they're out there, but they, you know, it's like other things we just kind of talked about. Animals tend to kind of want to do their own thing. So uh, if, if you are in an area where there are venomous species, for example, with rattlesnakes, uh, timber rattlesnakes or copperheads, uh, you certainly don't want to be reaching underneath rocks and logs and things like that. You got to watch where you step and, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, but really for the most part, those animals are in areas where people wouldn't be hiking and things like that. And if they were along a trail, you'd be able to see them pretty easily. Brian, you want to mention if you are hiking and you have a fallen log on the trail, the best way to approach that log if you're in an area with high densities of venomous species. Yeah, so uh, I actually got a slide here I can show. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Okay. So um, timber rattlesnakes get their name because uh, they spend a lot of time around timber. They are ambush predators. So they're waiting for a chipmunk or a squirrel or something like that to come along. And so they spend a lot of time in and around logs. And so if you're in an area where these things are at, you really need to step on the log and step a good distance beyond the log. You never want to step right off the log you know where that snake might be again a very rare species they're not common at all but it's something that it's a good practice a good habit to get into the other thing wendy that since you mentioned you know what should you do should you not do uh, one is always just try to identify the snake and i know brian and i have written some uh some books on that and there's there's a really great reference the snakes and lizards of indiana so if you're in the hoosier state you can look that up on the Purdue Education Store and, and purchase that pretty, pretty nominal fee. And it has all the snakes and, and lizards that we have in Indiana, including the venomous ones that we're talking about. But, and Brian, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe many, if not the majority of bites uh, of venomous snakes with people or people handling or attempting to handle or in some way, shape or form manipulating the animals. Oftentimes, if you can see the snake, uh, you can identify it and you just back away, your encounter is gonna be pretty pleasant. You'll get to see some of some, some really brilliantly colored venomous species and you guys can just kind of go on your separate paths and, and no harm, no foul. But it's usually when people try to handle them in any way where they get into trouble. Okay, note to self, don't touch the snake. And I'll just add too, if you, if you see those snakes, I mean, that's probably the number one question I get in extension since my specialty is herpetology. In fact, I got three snake questions just yesterday. Uh, and it's mostly snake identification questions. And so if you can take a safe distance, feel free to either email Brian McGowan or myself and Wendy, you can provide that in, in the chat window, our emails, you can send us those emails or those pictures via email and we're happy to try to identify those snakes um, as long as you can again, photograph them a safe distance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we both, we both get a lot of questions like that. And those are, those are the fun ones to answer. Uh, in my 20 years of doing this, I get a lot of snake question uh, emails with, with pictures and things. And only one time in those 20 years was it was one of those pictures an actual venomous species. So I'm sharing my screen right now, right? I don't think you can probably see it. Maybe you can, I don't know. But uh, so all of our pit vipers have that heat sensing pit between and below the eye and the nostril. The eye when at rest, when there's at, at light uh, is a cat-like uh, vertical slit. Now, obviously when there's limited light at night, that slit would open up just like our pupils get bigger in the dark, that kind of a thing. And so it's, um, that's a good example. And then this is a, a Southern black racer, a round pupil, uh, no heat sensing pit where that arrow is pointing between the, uh, and below the nostril and the eye. And so, you know, if you don't hang around snakes a lot, sometimes it can be difficult to tell. Uh, there's variability in a lot of these species, uh, but you know, sometimes the way the snake presents itself and things like that are really good clues as well. 
So I'll, I'll add to what Brian's saying, since you just showed those two great slides on snake identification. There's, there's two other things that I oftentimes, people be on the phone with me and they're very frantic that they think they have a rattlesnake in, in their yard or on their property. And they say, well, the snake has a really wide triangular shaped head and it's, and it's rattling its tail. I said, is it rattling its tail against a dried leaf or does it have a rattle on the end of the tail? Those are two very different things. Um, and if you think about it, many of these non-venomous snakes will have behaviors that mimic some of our venomous species. So we have two venomous rattlesnakes that Brian mentioned, but there's a lot of non-venomous species that when they're approached or they're threatened, they'll take their tail and vibrate it against whatever structures in the habitat to make it sound like a rattle because humans are programmed, right? Most mammals are programmed when they hear a rattle, they know a rattlesnake is around and their, and their response is to back away and leave the area. Snakes have adopted that particular strategy. The other thing with flattening the head, so many species like that black racer that Brian showed, if approached or harassed or aggravated, will oftentimes flatten its head. And when it flattens its head, it makes it look like it has a really wide triangular shaped head as well. Again, mimicking that of, that is a characteristic of our, our venomous species, but many of the non-venomous species will flatten their head to give that same appearance. So those are two, a couple of behavioral things that non-venomous species will do to emulate or imitate or mimic our venomous species. Great, and so we'll depart from the snake department for, for a moment. Um, um, most people are probably scared of them. Most people have probably had them in their barns or their houses and not known how to get them out. Um, okay, a few questions. First of all, are they blind? Second of all, do they really drink your blood? And third of all, I've heard they can get stuck in your hair. Brian, you wanna start with that one for me, please? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, are bats blind? Uh, no, they're not blind. They can see, uh, but they just don't rely on their sight. They rely on echolocation. And so all of our eastern bats are insectivores and, and can communicate with echolocation where they send out pulses of sound. They bounce back and then uh, they can kind of find the prey and that's how they do that. And so uh, they can see, but they just they, they rely on other senses uh, beyond their eyesight. Rod, do you want to take that one a little bit? Anything you want to share about bats in relation to either them being blind or drinking your blood or getting in your hair? Um, I can honestly say I have never, ever had a bat land in my hair in the last 20 years of my life. Never happened. I'll let you be the judge of why, <laughs> why that may or may not be the case, but they have never done so. But actually, you know, as Brian mentioned, they're insectivorous. And if you've ever watched a bat flying, um, some bats are very good at flying, even in a forested setting, right? And they're doing it at night and they're relying on their echolocation. They're incredibly agile flyers. And so they're oftentimes flying very agilely in the, in the air, trying to catch those insects. And so if we're outside and insects tend to be in our immediate space, bats may be swooping and, and being really agile to try to catch those insects that are in and around us. And I think that is what people uh, presume that the bats are doing is trying to you know, swoop down and, and attack the person or, or, or something like that, but they're really just after the insects that are in our immediate vicinity. I, I don't know of any instances in, in the Eastern United States or anywhere in the U.S. where bats have actively attacked someone, right? They're, they're after the insects that are in our space. Okay, and finally, we have to address this because all of us have been brainwashed clearly by vampires and Dracula and everything like that about bats and vampires wanting to drink our blood. Um, do bats really drink our blood? There are species, there is a vampire bat, um, and it does. It has re really modified incisors that, it, that's really, that are really sharp, and they're used to make a small incision. Oftentimes, it's on bowline, so cattle, and so they'll land on cattle. They're, they're very light-footed, and so the cow doesn't even know they're there. They'll take those incisors, make a really small incision, and a droplet of bud, blood will form, and then the bat will just lap that up with their tongue. Uh, but I'm not aware of any instances, and we don't have vampire bats here, and I'm not aware of, of, of any insectivorous bat doing anything, pursuing anything other than insects. Ryan, I don't know if you have anything to add. Nope, I think that covers it. Wendy, you're muted. 
So we're clear on bats now. They are not trying to drink your blood. They are not blind and they are not trying to get all up in your hair. So if that happens, it's an accident. Um, okay, switching gears here. Brian, I've heard that there are cougars and black bears in Indiana. Is that correct? Uh, so that's, that's a common question. So another, another picture that I get sent to me sometimes is a picture of a, a house cat that people think might be a cougar. And so there are actually cougars in Indiana uh, from time to time or all the time because sometimes people have them as pets. So years ago, uh, the DNR used to have a license that people can have exotic animals such as cougars or, or whatever. Uh, they did away with that from a court order years ago, uh, but they have that. So um, you can actually go online. I think you can post that uh, resources up there. CougarNet uh, is this national research network uh, for cougars, and they actually have a map of confirmed sightings up there. And so it's actually kind of kind of neat from that standpoint. Um, I think I can actually uh, get it up here really quick if I'm fast enough, but uh, I thought I had it up there. Yeah, here it is. So I'm gonna share my screen just really quick since I'm getting good at it there. So this is their website. And so you can see Indiana, there's three, but if you zoom in there, whoopsie, sorry about that. There's only one. And so there's one confirmed uh, sighting of cougars in Indiana in the wild. And so this was one from 2010. And so there's a big story about this, uh, pictures in the paper, but if you look closely at the picture, it actually had a metal ear tag in it. So when, uh, uh, when you have these things, you know, and you had a permit, you actually had to have them marked, you know, in some fashion in this case is with an ear tag. And so this was probably someone's escaped pet or maybe they just didn't want it anymore, so they let it go. Uh, occasionally, uh, you notice in the map here, in Illinois, they, they've got quite a few more. And so those are probably young males dispersing from the nearest Western population, which is in, I think, Northwest uh, Nebraska. And so male animals tend to disperse really long distances. That's kind of nature's way of mixing up the genetic pool, so to speak. And they're just kind of going off looking for their own, own place. Sometimes they'll stop and set up camp and other times they'll turn around and kind of head back the other way. Uh, some folks may recall years ago, it was probably, oh, I want to say 10 or 15 years ago, a farmer in Indiana shot and killed a wolf. That was a young male disperse, dispersing from a pack in Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm, I think right around that same time, we also had a young male wolverine. And it was the first time a wolverine was documented in Indiana in something like 200 years. So uh, sometimes you get those kind of weird things, but those are typically young males dispersing. But so the answer is we have them, but it's not like we have this free ranging wild population that's reproducing on its own, that kind of stuff. Most of them are pets or, or you could possibly get kind of a, a young dispersing male uh, from a population from far away. Okay, so if we see a cougar, it's possible, but probably not likely, and we probably should just leave him alone. He's not going to hurt us. Yeah, most of the time, you know, cougars are, are uh, if they're around, you really don't see them, kind of like bobcats, you know, so um, the chances of seeing a cougar <laughs> in Indiana, uh, you're probably... Uh, you know, this is just a, a, a educated guess. Okay, so this isn't a, a fact, but uh, my guess is you'd probably be better, uh, more likely to get struck by lightning than see a cougar in Indiana. You're muted, Wendy. Um, so, Rod, let's throw it back to you. So something I was told as a child, um, snapping turtles, stay away from them because they can actually take off your finger. Is that true? Am I going to lose a finger if I stick my finger near the mouth of a snapping turtle? Uh, as, an, as a grown adult person, uh, no. So snapping turtles don't have the bite force uh, to remove an adult finger or toe. Uh, now remember, so, so turtles uh, don't have teeth. Their, their teeth are replaced by a horny sheath on both the top and bottom. And snapping turtles do have a, a pretty significant bite force, meaning that they can bite and a large, you know, 15 or 20 pound snapping turtle will likely break the skin if, if it bites you and will certainly hurt, uh, but it is not powerful enough to remove your 
your finger. And oftentimes you get asked, well, you always preface it by saying, you know, an adult human, what about my, my baby? I said, well, there's so many things that I <laughs> wrong with that question. Uh, you shouldn't have a baby, you know, anywhere near a snapping turtle's mouth anyway, but snapping turtles in general, they don't have a, a bite force strong enough to, to bite off your finger, your bite off your toe, to snap broomsticks, anything like that. Those are all just things that I think, again, Parents have told their children to keep their fingers away from the business end of a snapping turtle uh, because I have, I've been bitten two or three times by snapping turtles and I do have all 10 of my fingers. Uh, did it hurt? Yes. In one occasion, it, it did draw blood and you have to treat that. Uh, you think about the environments that they live in, it can have a chance for bacterial infections. So you put some Neosporin on it to keep them from getting infected, some topical antibiotic. Otherwise you should be okay. Maybe a bit bruised, maybe break the skin, but otherwise should be okay. Good to know. So I will mind the turtles, but they probably aren't going to make me lose a digit. Got it. Okay, so Brian, um, let's toss it to you. Let's let's talk birds for a minute. Um, so I've heard that the reason that we don't have rough grouse in Indiana and maybe some other species is that we traded them to another state um, for birds that we did want. Help me out on this whole thing of raising and releasing wild animals or establishing populations. What's really going on there? Yeah, that's 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 a good question. I see that printed on websites sometimes, and I hear that you know, giving talks to folks and things like that. They just kind of hear this kind of a thing, and on the surface, it kind of like it makes sense, right? Because those things kind of coincided about the same time that our decline in rough grouse happened. We had an increase in turkeys, and so just because things happened at the same time is not necessarily a cause and effect thing. And so years ago, um, states were kind of, you know, they would do this quite a bit and they still do to some extent that if they have abundance of a species and someone, another state wants to repopulate, they will take, you know, catch those and, and move them to the other state and, and let them go in appropriate habitat. And so that was a, an example of that is wild turkey, where wild turkey were caught and moved around. And not only in Indiana, but many other states, uh, they really, it's kind of a wildlife management success story where they repopulated areas with for wild turkey, which were, were native to that, those areas. Uh, rough grouse, the decline of grouse is really a habitat issue. So grouse, they like woodlands, but they also like young forests, brushy land, old field kind of habitats. Uh, just to um, just kind of give you an example here. Let me show you um, another picture here. Sorry, uh, flipping back and forth. Uh, I sh show this just to prove to Rod that I actually do get out in the field sometimes, but this was many years ago. Uh, this was actually a grouse drumming log. So grouse are kind of neat. The males sometimes will stand elevated on a, a log typically, but it could be you know, a rock or some other thing, just kind of elevate them and they'll beat their wings. Uh, people liken it to the sound of a motorboat, you know, trying to pull on an outboard um, a, a motor. Uh, but the, the forest around them is a really young forest. And so that dense uh, stand of young trees really helps to protect them from avian predators because they'll be very, it's very difficult for them to fly through there and catch them. So when they're standing on this log drumming away, uh, they're susceptible. And so having, you know, that's one of their habitat components, but the young forest is also important for uh, brood cover where the young can kind of go in and out of here on the ground, protect from predators, that kind of a thing. And so it's really, it's really a habitat issue. Uh, I know there was a, some thought you know, not too long ago from some government officials in the state, they were looking at the wild turkey program thinking like, well, we caught wild turkeys and released them um, and they did well. Uh, so we should do that with grouse. The problem is, is that you got to have the habitat. And so if you don't have the habitat, you're wasting time, money, and resources. It's just not going to work. So while we're on the topic of turkeys, I've heard that rattlesnakes were released in Indiana to control the wild turkey population. And I've also heard the really creepy fact that they drop them from helicopters in order to do that. Is that true? Yeah, so that's that's another another thing. So, um, you know, we've always had rattlesnakes in Indiana. In fact, they used to be much more abundant, much more widespread. So now uh, the primary range is really in the south central part of the state where you have good habitat and then good uh, den sites. So the den and rocky outcrops and, and those kinds of things. So that karst topography in south central Indiana is really uh, beneficial to them in that in that way. 
Uh, and so we've always kind of had turkeys. And so um, those things are really not related um, from, from that standpoint. The other thing is, is that rattlesnakes really don't eat turkey eggs. Um, and so we talked a little bit before they're ambush predators. And so um, they're going to hang at trees and logs and things like that because they're going to catch mammals. And so I'm not aware of turkey eggs rolling around logs and things like that. Now, if a snake actually came across, you know, a, a very young turkey or something like that, that they're able to strike and kill or maybe even an egg, I don't know, I guess it's possible, you know, if they, they could certainly fit in their mouth and there are snakes that do consume eggs. Uh, but rattlesnakes really don't eat that many times a year. And um, they really are ambush predators for small mammals. And so even if they did, all they ate was turkey eggs, which is not, uh, I don't think there's enough of them out there to really do any kind of appreciable damage in terms of reducing population. So if, if that was the case, it would be a very poor reason to do it because it wouldn't work. As far as them, you know, falling out of helicopters. Uh, I hear that a lot. Uh, I, if I'm going to release animals, dropping them out of a helicopter doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. I don't know if they give them little parachutes or whatever, uh, but maybe uh, this phenomenon is what maybe triggered that. And so rattlesnakes are actually good climbers. And uh, when I mentioned I was doing my research on the hardwood ecosystem experiment, uh, there was also other things going on. And so there's people studying the production of, you know, mast acorns and, and nuts by trees. And in years that you had poor acorn crops, you had poor small mammal numbers because they really depended on those acorns. And then, so that's food for rattlesnakes. And so a year following that, we actually had um, a lot of snakes, not a lot, but more than one, uh, actually spend time up in trees. And this is a, a, one of our snakes. She was a female, an adult female, and she spent something like two or three weeks straight in a tree. And so presumably she was, she was hunting. Uh, when we catch them in bags, they actually defecate. And so one time I had had a snake in a bag that did that. And there was a small yellow feather in there, presumably from like a songbird or something like that, just based on the size of it. And so, it, you know, it makes you wonder if these things are adjusting their feeding uh, uh, behavior where they're going to ambush uh, a small bird that lands close to them up in a tree. So pretty, pretty neat. But uh, dropping out of helicopters, no, no, that's, that's just not the way it's done. <laughs> Well, let's turn it to happier topics. Rod, I know your specialty is hellbenders, and um, they're probably a very misunderstood species. And there's a lot of myths out there uh, regarding hellbenders. Number one, are they poisonous? And number two, can they really be as big as a person? <laughs> so uh, can hellbenders be as big as a person? No. Uh, the biggest hellbender, and I've probably handled and seen tens of thousands of hellbenders, some in captivity and thousands of them in the wild. The largest one I've ever seen was 22 inches and weighed about four and a half or five pounds. So that's still a huge salamander, right? Now, when I was in China, uh, the Chinese giant salamander, one of the ones I saw in the Qingling Mountains was about a meter and a half long and its head was 10 inches across and it weighed uh, close to about 80, 80 pounds. So that was big as a small child, right? But we don't have Chinese giant salamanders here in Indiana. We don't have them in North America. So no, myth busted, they do not get big as a man. Now, are they poisonous? Well, that's a question I get about a lot of amphibians. So if you think about amphibians and hellbenders in particular, one of their nicknames is called snot otter. And they're called snot otters for a very good reason. They produce copious quantities of slime on their skin. And that slime's really important. That slime helps deter, helps protect the hellbender from the environment, right? It gives it the slime coat, which helps prevent some deleterious bacteria, some harmful bacteria from getting in through the skin. Uh, it helps keep them moist. It helps make them slimy. So when bald herpetologists try to capture them under the water, they, they slip out of my hands. And so, you know, other predators trying to at attack a hellbender, that slime is slimy and it makes it difficult to capture. And in, in some species of amphibians, uh, that, that slime coating can be somewhat poisonous or have some sort of toxins in it. So the, the best case example in North America are, are newts. Uh, it's called a tetrodotoxin, uh, which is a, a non-proteinaceous toxin that's produced in the skin. And again, it's a deterrent for predators. Some of our toads, like our American toad, they have these paratoid glands that are right behind their eyes 
that are also mildly toxic. And so if you were to rub your, your finger on that parotoid gland and then rub your eye or rub your nose or, or, or wipe your mouth, uh, depending on the, the, the toad and how much irritant you get on it, it can be distasteful. It can make your tongue, you know, uh, sore or hurt. It can make your nose burn. It can make your eyes burn in water as well. So mildly, a mild irritant uh, to your mucosal cavity and mucosal linings. Uh, and many of our salamanders will have that. Um, and hellbender's skin uh, is, they're not poisonous, right? If you touch them, you know, you're, you're not going to die. You're, you're, they're not like the, the golden frog or the poison dart frogs that you see in Central America, which have really high levels of toxins in their skin, which is, but those species oftentimes it's called um, um, a posomatic. They're very brightly colored. So they're bright orange, bright red, bright green. Any, any of those organisms that have those really, really bright colorations, if they're amphibians, oftentimes they're signaling that their skin is very toxic, very poisonous to the touch, so that you want to leave them alone. Hellbenders are dark brown. Their skin's designed to you know, be slimy to help elude predators, but also blend in with their environment. So you can, if you are lucky enough to ever see a hellbender, they are an endangered species, so they're protected by law. Most people will never get a chance to see a hellbender, but they're not toxic to the touch. Just a reminder, if you have any questions um, that we haven't addressed, any myths you want busted, um, please put those in the comment section here on Facebook and uh, Rod and Brian will answer those. Um, keeping on that same topic of uh, things that can cause you not so happy results, um, toads. Can I really get warts from touching a toad or frog? So before I go off the hellbenders, I remember one thing, I would be remiss, my help the hellbender crew would would string me up if they knew that I didn't um, mention the helpthehellbender.org. So if you have other questions about hellbenders or other hellbender myths, we have a lot of information on our helpthehellbender.org website. And Wendy, you can put that in the comment section for us here for a little bit. So back to the warts, I think this is along the same vein that Brian was talking about earlier that parents tell their children. Uh, toads are, especially American toads and Fowler's toads in Indiana are very common around human dwellings. So it's probably one of the amphibian species that most of us encounter the most frequently. And I think a lot of parents just don't want their kids touching, you know, amphibians. And so they, you know, somehow that's probably how that created, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've ever picked up a toad, one of the very first things they usually do is void their bladder, right? In other words, they urinate on you, they pee on you. And the old, the old adage is, you know, if, if a toad pees on you, you're going to get warts. If that was the case, as many toads as if I handled, I wouldn't be able to move my fingers because my fingers would be covered in warts, right? That is certainly not true. That myth is busted. So um, do they cause hair loss though? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> Pretty sure that's genetics, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, but I will say, you know, so, you know, if you see those, to if you see toads and they do urinate, urinate on you, it's not going to cause warts, but I will say that most amphibians and reptiles in the wild, there was a study done probably 15 years ago at this point that found in over 90% of all amphibians and reptiles in the wild, they have salmonella, salmonella bacteria in their GI tract. And so if they defecate or urinate on you, it really is important to wash your hands really thoroughly with soap and water um, before putting your hands anywhere near any of your mucosal linings or certainly before you eat to make sure that you minimize the chance of contracting uh, salmonella, salmonella poisoning or bacterium in your body, which causes severe abdominal cramping and diarrhea. So, you know, if you're handling them, they urinate them, just wash your hands before you eat, but you don't have to worry about warts. So bottom line, good hygiene will help protect you in, in a lot of those cases. Um, so wash your hands, uh, especially this time of year and, and in this current situation that we're in. Um, but you're not going to get a wart. So congratulations on that. Um, another parent myth busted. Um, anything else you guys want to discuss that we haven't mentioned um, I know, Brian, you're dealing with moles and voles a lot and other outdoor creatures um, that, that we might see around our house a lot. I know a lot of the ones Rod talked about are, are ones we may not see in our, in our environments, in our backyards. Are there some of those animals maybe there are myths about that we haven't talked about um, that, that we should be aware of? Wow, I'm trying to trying to think uh, off, off the top of my top of my head I, um boy I just nothing nothing's popping in my mind I'm still thinking about uh 
warts and things like that like this the the toads like things that rod was saying kind of sparked a story in my head about like one time my dog ate a toad and of course about a half hour later it came back up again so um, but that's <laughs> so dogs dogs don't like them either yeah. you know those those paratoid glands are they, they, especially on uh, if you go to southern united states and uh, along the atlantic coastal states places like florida we have the marine toad which is an introduced species and they have huge paratoid glands and they actually they can uh, make you sick um, if dogs or cats attack a marine toad. Those paratoid glands are so large and the, the toxins are, are potent enough that it can kill small pets that attack that toad. But here in Indiana, or it's mostly going to cause mild irritation to any mucosal lining that you come into contact with. And I have tested that and it does, it burns. It's not pleasant. Maybe that's why I'm bald. That is not a myth. It's a please mystery. Do, we'll please never do, know. Don't the email answer. me and say that. There's no no fact there because I was kidding. <laughs> That's a um, so this has been super educational today. I know I had a lot of myths that I grew up with busted. Um, are there species that um, you get a lot of questions about um, that you want to mention um, that folks maybe need to be aware of, um, whether that be in in your world of herpetology rod or or Brian in, in wildlife that we see around us um, that we should be aware of or things like that, that and, and other species you get a lot of questions about. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think maybe in the promo video, many of the questions that I get deal around amphibians and reptiles because that's my area of specialization and Brian and Jared Brooke cover a lot of the other more uh, general wildlife questions. But almost all the questions that I get revolve around identification. And that's one of the reasons Brian and I wrote all those herpetology uh, field, uh, field guides. So we have snakes of Indiana, turtles of Indiana, frogs and toads of Indiana, and salamanders of Indiana. Because I think as you alluded to earlier, Wendy, those are species that are probably less familiar to most people. And so one of the very first things they have is, you know, what do I have? And, and there are periods of time um, like right now when, when it's starting to warm up and people are becoming uh, more active, uh, they come into contact with more snakes. And then usually in the fall, when snakes are getting ready to find their hibernacula or a place to overwinter where they can stay safe and warm, they end up in people's basements, uh, trying to get in people's foundations. That's another big time when I get a lot of snake calls because people are again encountering the calls near their dwellings. So I'll just say, you know, and I say this on almost every program that I do, all of our phones have really great cameras now. Don't hesitate to snap a quick picture and then send an email to, to me or Brian or Jared and say, hey, you know, can you help me identify that? And obviously try to take as good a quality picture as you can, take pictures of the head, the, the body, you know, give us as, as much opportunity to positively identify that animal for you as possible. That's, I mean, I just did two or three of those this week with some some Northern water snakes because the person thought it might, they didn't know if it was venomous or not. I said, I don't know. Uh, send me a picture and they sent me a really high quality photo and I could immediately tell them what species it was. It was non-venomous and, and what to do after that. Yeah. The, the one thing that just popped in my head while, while Rod was talking is, is another question I get is, is, is water snakes. So people see a water snake and they all automatically think it's a cotton mouth. So there's really only a couple places in Indiana that there actually is our cotton mouths, but it's really easy to tell the difference when they're in the water. So all the pit vipers, uh, copperheads, cottonmouths, all the, all snakes are capable of swimming. You just don't see them in the water sometimes, right? But they all inflate their lungs before they get in the water. So they, a lot of their body is right on top of the water. So you can see most of their body where other snakes don't do that. So you see just the head, I'm trying to do this on the camera and the, the rest of it, you don't see underwater unless you're close to it. And so that's a really good field indicator of telling the difference between a, a cotton mouth or potentially another pit viper as opposed to other snakes. I hope they're not in the water that I'm in. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, I'll leave them out there for you guys to study. Uh, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Um, I, I hope that if you have other questions, um, you be, feel free to put those in the comments section and. Brian and Rod and even Jared Brooke might even answer those after the fact for you. Um, that's what we're here for. Uh, Purdue Extension is here for you um, to help you identify the things around you, help you manage your land, help you um, manage the wildlife on your area, properties and things like that. So feel free to reach out to our experts. You can use the Purdue Extension website. Um, and uh, 
and do that. And I've also put the emails for Rod and Brian in there. They don't mind getting random questions. I send them to you to them all the time um, from various uh, people around the, the state. Um, so send in those questions. That's what we're here for. Um, that's why we do this Ask the Expert series. And we hope today um, was very helpful for you guys in busting some of those myths that we've all lived with our whole lives. Um, next week, uh, speaking of Jared Brooke, he'll be on. He's talking about tips for fall food plots. So you can get ready to get those grouse or those deer or whatever you're looking to get in your yard. Um, get, them, get them ready for them. Uh, so uh, thanks, Rod. Thanks, Brian. Um, super educational today. Um, appreciate it. No problem. You bet. All right. We'll see you all next week, 3 p.m. Thursday, uh, talking with Jared Brooks about tips for fall food plots. <laughs>